Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. This is one of the educational activities promoted by the International Headache Society and will be available soon in the Learning Center of the recently released uh, new website of the IHS. Uh, our topic today is rather challenging condition for neurologists, radiologists, and anesthetists, and uh, all headache specialists. Uh, the diagnosis, the management, and the very understanding of spontaneous intracranial hypotension went through a remarkable progression over the last decade. That is what we need to address such a disabling condition, actually. Together with my colleague, Henrik Schutz from IHS Educational Committee, I'm happy to welcome two experts of great experience and uncountable publications in the field. Unfortunately, due to unexpected conditions, Dr. Silberstein, who was supposed to join us today, won't be able. Uh, we are very uh, sorry uh, for not having him today, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to have him talking about this theme, which is of his great interest too. Uh, today we have Dr. Simi Perrick and Dr. Peter Krenz talking uh, about spontaneous intracranial hypertension. To begin with, uh, I would, I'd like to welcome Dr. Simi Perry. She's an assistant professor of neurology at Jefferson Headache Center in Philadelphia, United States. Dr. Perry is on the board of the Spinal CSF League Foundation and is the founder of the Multidisciplinary Spontaneous Spinal CSF League Center at Jefferson Center, uh, Headache Center. Please, Dr. Perry, you may share with us your slides and I look very much forward to learning with your presentation. Okay, so good evening. Um, again, thank you for that introduction. I have this great responsibility and privilege at the Thomas Jefferson University of developing a multidisciplinary spontaneous spinal CSF league center um, and have gotten to know this disease or condition, however you want to call it, quite well. Um, so let's start talking a little bit about, um, these are my disclosures. I'm on the Spinal CSF Fleet Foundation and have um, a salary support from a Teva educational grant. So let's start talking about spinal, spontaneous spinal CSF leaks. And the main goal of my talk today, and I'm sure Peter's talk as well, is to avoid misdiagnosis of patients with spontaneous spinal CSF leaks. It's such a devastating disease and early diagnosis and treatment is optimal. Now, many of you may have, may have called this disease, you may call this spontaneous spinal CSF leak a rare disorder, but actually the incidence and the prevalence of the disorder is vastly underestimated because the diagnosis is often missed and patients are often misdiagnosed as migraine, curing malformation, or a psychiatric disease. What we do know about this is that the people who are diagnosed, the majority are adults, usually in their 40s, and there is a female predominance with a female to male ratio of about two to one. Now the history of spontaneous spinal CSF leak has been described over the years, and it's actually important because it really reflects some of our confusion about the disorder and may explain in part why the disorder continues to go underdiagnosed. Our knowledge of spontaneous spinal CSF leak has actually been around for a while. It was first termed allegoria, which means lacking or absence of by a German scientist who used it to describe very low or even negative CSF pressures in his patients. From the 1960s to the 1990s, our ability to demonstrate CSF leaks and study CSF dynamics was revolutionized by the advent of neuroimaging tools, such as radionucleotide cystinography, conventional myelography, and MRI. And with these tools, we saw signs of leak. We saw pachymeningeal enhancement and vein engorgement, which, if you remember from the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, occur to compensate for lack of CSF in the brain space. And so for this reason, in the late 1990s, spontaneous spinal CSF leak was called CSF hypovolemia, or CSF volume depletion. However, these patients were also noted to have low CSF pressure. And so this is how this competing term, one that you may be most familiar with, the spontaneous intracranial hypotension came about. Since CSF pressure is the most objective measure of spinal CSF leak, 
this name has stuck. However, it truly does not capture all of what we know this disorder is. And so in the new millennium, Dr. Wader Shivink has advocated for the term spontaneous spinal CSF week, which is how you may have heard me describe this disorder today. So why this term? Well, it captures the features of the disorder that we think are important in communicating what it really is. The first is that the CSF leak is spontaneous. It should occur with minimal or no clear precipitant. There are, of course, small exceptions to this. The word spontaneous is important because patients with spontaneous leaks can have, um, you know, very uh, different prognosis and workup than patients with iatrogenic and traumatic CSF leaks. The second is that the CSF leak should be from a spinal source. This term is important because the, major, the majority of people studying this dis disorder do not think that depletion of CSF volume is the sole cause of all the symptoms and that the spinal location of the leak matters. So what do I mean by that? For example, people with skull-based leaks presenting with CSF rhinorrhea or otorrhea, conditions that also cause CSF volume depletion, rarely, if ever, develop symptoms or brain imaging findings consistent with spontaneous spinal CSF leak. And if they do, these patients should be assessed for a spinal etiology. Now, I had mentioned that there were some exceptions to the word spontaneous. There are several contributing factors that we think underlie this disorder. Mainly, patients in which this occurs truly spontaneously may have an underlying connective tissue disorder, which results in spinal dural weakness. And for those people, it's important to assess them for clinical features such as hypermobile joints and hyperextensible skin, and if indicated, follow up with genetic studies. CSF venous fistula, which I'm sure Dr. Kranz will talk to you about later, is also another factor. It's rare and only recently diagnosed as a cause of spinal CSF leak. And CSF venous fistulas create a direct communication between spinal subarachnoid space and the epidural veins, which allows the loss of CSF directly into the circulation, and these are corrected surgically. CSF leak can also occur from a dural tear from a spondylitic spur or an osteophyte or a rupture of a Charlov cyst, which is a CSF-filled nerve root cyst found most commonly at the sacral level of the spine. And it's also associated with trivial trauma, such as whiplash or excessive coughing. Now, this is important. Why do people with spinal CSF leak have head pain? And specifically, why do they have orthostatic head pain? We've had to base our theories on its pathophysiology and what we already know. We know that CSF supports the brain. The brain would be nearly 30 times its weight without it. The remaining weight is supported by the brain's suspension from several pain-sensitive structures. When someone with spinal CSF leak stands upright, the brain would descend and cause traction on these structures, which explains the orthostatic nature of the headache. Another theory, and the reason why we think symptoms happen specifically with spinal leaks, is because of shifts in the hydrostatic indifferent point. Now, this is the point at which pressure does not change with posture. And that point varies among individuals, but we think it typically is located between C7 and T5. And according to this theory, spinal CSF leak causes symptoms by increasing compliance of the lower spinal CSF space and causing some degree of spinal dural sac collapse. So imagine a tight casing of a pipe through which water, or in this case CSF, is running through. A hole in the pipe would then cause the lower part of the pipe to become loose and more compliant. This increased compliance of the lower spinal CSF space in itself would cause the hydrostatic indifferent point to move caudally in the direction of the increased compliance. And so when the patient is upright, there is a lower intracranial CSF pressure. And so going back to what we talked about earlier, decreased intracranial CSF pressure leads to compensatory dilation of pain-sensitive intracranial blood vessels, which in turn causes orthostatic headache. And this theory is important because it explains how symptoms caused by spinal CSF leak can be independent of how much CSF volume there actually is, or even how much the opening pressure is. So now that you've gotten a bit of an overview of what spontaneous spinal CSF leak is, I want to now cover how it presents and really the difficulties we face in clinically diagnosing this disorder. So classically, spontaneous spinal CSF leak would present as an orthostatic headache, like we talked about. 
Usually the onset of the disorder occurs abruptly and the symptoms happen daily after that. Valsalvin maneuvers like cough or strain typically worsen the symptoms and lying down flat helps the symptoms. However, about a fourth of people either start out with or then later develop a non-orthostatic headache, meaning that the headache can happen regardless of the position. And sometimes, even more confusingly, the patient's headache can go away altogether or never even be there in the first place. And in these patients, auditory symptoms predominate or they might have a dementia-like presentation. Importantly, even when patients do have an orthostatic headache, that in itself might vary. The positional component usually takes a few minutes or an hour or two to develop, but there are patients who can also present with a sudden onset thunderclap headache on standing, or the patient can be headache free in the morning and only get a headache later on in the day after prolonged standing. In addition to the headache, as you can see from this table, there are many other neurological symptoms that can happen due to traction on the cranial nerves as the brain descends downwards. And of all of these that you see on the table, I want to point out the hearing changes. Patients often do complain of muffled hearing or tinnitus along with their other neurological symptoms. And in addition to the cranial nerves, the brain tissue structures themselves can be distorted. And these symptoms can be suggestive of Parkinsonism or even frontotemporal dementia, as I talked about earlier. The bottom line here is that all of us should have a very high index of suspicion for this disorder in patients with refractory neurological symptoms that cannot otherwise be attributed to another cause. So that being said, there are other causes of orthostatic positional headache that we have to consider. So patients with cervicogenic headache from upper cervical degenerative joint disease with, ha, can have referred pain in the cervical dermatomes. The orthostatic component results from axial loading when they stand upright. People with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is interestingly due to increased CSF pressure can nonetheless have worsening of headache on exertion. And some patients might be confused between the exertional and orthostatic components. Patients with POTS, in which dysautonomia results from an abnormal increase in heart rate when standing, um, this can lead to decreased filling of epidural venous plexus, and they can also have an orthostatic headache. And given all the possible variations in presentation of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, chronic migraine, which is caused by activation of the trigeminal vascular system, and new daily persistent headache should also be considered. There's also a, dis a disorder called cervic craniocervical instability, which comes up occasionally, especially in patients with Ehlers-Danlos. This is a bit of a debated diagnosis, but it is also something that we might need to think about when someone has daily positional headache. The important thing to remember here is that none of these diagnoses are mutually exclusive and that patients can have one of these diagnoses as well as spontaneous spinal CSF leak, or they can have another diagnosis while they also have spontaneous spinal CSF leak. So how do we diagnose spontaneous spinal CSF leak? These are the official diagnostic criteria proposed by the ICHD-3. But to many of us who treat patients with spontaneous spinal CSF leak, there are a few issues with these criteria. If we suspect someone of having leak, tapping them to obtain opening pressure risks making them significantly worse. And I'm sure Dr. Kent will talk about this, but imaging is not always reliable. And so sometimes we're left with a very complicated clinical picture. And I've included a few short cases here of real patients that I've seen at the Jefferson Headache Center over the past few months to demonstrate this. So this is an example of a patient I saw recently. She's 39. She had no history of headache, but she did have a history of motion sickness as a child and pre of B with blood draws, which sometimes goes along with migraine. And then at the age of 38, she had a new onset headache occurring after she stood for a period of time. And she noticed that that continued to happen when she was standing, the headache would occur and, and get worse in the evening. It would be a bit of a second half of the day phenomenon. And she described the pain as radiating from the back of her head to the front and it only lasted a few hours and it subsided when she lay down. She did have sensitivity to light and sound with the head pain, again, which kind of overlaps with migraine. And she took Exeteran and ibuprofen with some relief, again, a kind of migraine feature. 
And because of all of those reasons I just talked about, she was first diagnosed with migraine. And I'm not going to go too much into imaging because you'll hear from Dr. Krantz, um, but you can see here from this image that she has tonsillar ectopia. There's some flattening of the pons um, and a decrease of the prepontine space and some decrease also of the mammalopontine space. And to me, these were clear signs of leak, but she went over time misdiagnosed as only migraine. So she eventually received a targeted blood patch and her positional headache improved immediately after. And interestingly, she came to see me. She still had a migraineous headache with sensitivity to light or sound about once a week, but that positional component was gone. And this case was, I'm bringing it up today, is because it, it shows that we should suspect spontaneous spinal CSF leak, even in patients who might also have migraine. And we should specifically suspect spontaneous spinal CSF leak in patients in which the symptoms of migraine have changed or in which they continue to describe the second half of the day phenomena. The second case is a 70 year old female who started having a new onset neck pain in May, 2019. And she described this as a pulling sensation between her scapula, which is very characteristic of the coat hanger type of pain seen in patients with spontaneous spinal CSF leak. And that pain was refractory to trigger point injections and she had the set blocks and that didn't help. Eventually, the pain began migrating from her back to the top of her head, and she developed other symptoms, including high-pitched tinnitus and numbness in her left hand, her left foot, and her left lower leg. A brain MRI showed an enlarged pituitary and enlarged transverse sinuses, and an MRI thoracic spine showed engorgement of the mid-thoracic epidural venous plexus. And for this reason, she underwent a targeted epidural blood patch and she had resolution of her head pain, but she still continued to have symptoms of neck pain, tinnitus, and left hand and foot numbness. And so she had a repeat brain MRI done and it showed resolution of those signs that they had seen originally. So there was no more pituitary change or any venous sinus change. And then after a while, she was sent to a psychiatrist and she received some anti-anxiety treatment. So she came to our center to actually see us for a second opinion and we ordered a repeat spinal MRI, which showed that there was still a small epidural fluid collection in the mid thoracic spine. She was ultimately found to have an osteophyte causing a ventral dural tear, and this was surgically repaired and all her symptoms improved over the course of a month. Her case demonstrates that spontaneous spinal CSF leak does not always present with head pain and it could instead present with neck or this kind of coat hanger type of pain and this case also shows that brain imaging findings and head pain can resolve even with ongoing leak. So ongoing neurological symptoms deserve continued workup and can also be treated by addressing the leak. And this is the last case which is actually currently active and it demonstrates the need for better diagnostic measures. So this is a 36 year old male. He had no prior history of headache who and um, he did, however, experience this whiplash-like neck injury that resulted in non-positional headache in 2019. He described his current headache as pain in the back of his head, radiating from the skull to his neck, and he had this ear popping sensation that was similar to being on an airplane. These symptoms actually gradually resolved over the course of a year. And then a few months later in March, 2020, he had this test by a physical therapist to evaluate for ligamentous injury. And immediately the back of his head pain, the, the head pain on the back of his head returned. And it was especially worse when he was going from sitting to standing. And then over time, he developed high pitched tinnitus. And over the next few months, he developed imbalance and intermittent numbness and tremors throughout the day. And when I saw him, he was lying in bed 22 hours a day. Um, he was avoiding any other kind of movements to prevent him from having this terrible head pain. He received an untargeted blood patch in early August and had no benefit. And then in the past month, he developed supine headache and severe anxiety, and he was actually admitted to our inpatient service for further workup and treatment and received anti-migraine medication, which actually did help this kind of worsened um, headache feature. But he still had a positional headache. He still had to lie down. Uh, so I actually referred him to our neuroradiology uh, department for a CT myelogram, 
And they did a diagnostic test where they put preservative-free saline in, and that improved his headache. And so he's going to go back for a therapeutic CT myelogram. And this is his brain MRI, and you can see it's essentially unremarkable. So all of these cases show that there are still many questions about diagnosing spontaneous spinal CSF leak. And maybe these are some questions that you might be thinking of right now, but we really don't have a lot of evidence-based answers yet. We are getting more research, but, we, but the research still needs to continue. And I'm actually working on this multidisciplinary committee with Dr. Silverstein, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, and Dr. Krantz and others to answer some of these questions and create formal guidelines or expert opinions. And these are some of the questions that we're working on right now that are highlighted in red. So that's my part of the talk and um, I appreciate your time and, and um, for all of those of you who are listening. Great. Thank you so much to uh, Simi for this uh, excellent presentation. So, so we'll, we'll go on uh, with the next uh, speaker in, in this webinar. And um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Peter Krantz, uh, and it's an honor to present you. Dr. Krantz is an associate professor of uh, radiology, and he's a division uh, chief of radiology at Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina, US. Uh, Dr. Kranz has extensive clinical and uh, research experience in the diagnosis and treatment of spontaneous intracranial hypertension. This uh, includes uh, expertise in imaging, diagnosis, and management uh, of this disorder. So uh, Dr. Kranz is definitely a well-chosen lecturer for this webinar, and I look very much forward to this lecture on uh, spontaneous intracranial hypertension imaging for the headache specialist. And before Peter starts, I'll just like to say, please uh, write some uh, questions in the QA um, uh, section, and we'll then answer them in the uh, QA session after Peter's uh, talk. So please, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. And uh, hopefully my internet hold, I apologize. I've been having a couple issues with it. Uh, just in the past couple of minutes, but thank you very much, uh, Henrik, and thanks to Marcio and the International he uh, Headache Society for the, um, the opportunity to talk to you. I'm gonna be talking a lot about uh, the imaging uh, of uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension or, or spinal CSF leak. Um, I'm a radiologist, so there's gonna be lots of pictures, um, which I hope will be good for our European colleagues who uh, are staying up late to, to join us. Uh, let's see, let me make this go. Okay, so um, as uh, Dr. Parikh told you, this is uh, intracranial hypotension is an important and potentially treatable cause, uh, secondary cause of headache. And it is caused by a spinal CSF leak in essentially all cases. Um, and imaging is really important, both uh, in the diagnosis and treatment uh, of these patients um, that we'll, we'll talk about here. As Dr. Preek showed you earlier, the ICHD3 criteria for uh, spontaneous intracranial potential have a couple of key features that I want to call your attention to. The first is um, a discussion of a CSF pressure less than 60 uh, millimeters. And as Simi told you, the, the reliance on CSF pressure is becoming less and less all the time. And we use it sort of as a minor or a secondary uh, feature now, because what we found is that in the vast majority of people with CSF leaks, their pressure is greater than 60, sometimes uh, greater than 200. Uh, I've even seen some people in the 300s with active CSF leaks. Uh, so it's not a particularly reliable uh, feature. The other uh, important feature that we want to look at uh, is imaging evidence. Uh, imaging evidence either on a brain MRI uh, showing some characteristic findings uh, or on spine imaging. And I'm going to be going over both the brain and the spine imaging features with you today. Uh, 
So I, I promise that uh, Dr. Perik and I did not coordinate uh, our differential diagnosis for orthostatic headaches, but um, there are a couple of things that need to be considered when other uh, patients present with orthostatic headaches. Um, and one of the most common things that we see in our practice is uh, dysautonomias, and in particular POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Because of the mechanism of POTS and the fact that it causes uh, underfilling of the spinal uh, epidural venous plexus, the symptoms uh, with POTS uh, precisely overlap the symptoms with intracranial hypotension. Um, so sometimes these, these patients will have more in the way of palpitations or more dizziness or presyncope um, symptoms, uh, but there's quite a overlap between uh, the symptoms of patients who have um, POTS and patients who have intracranial hypertension. We also think about uh, cervicogenic headaches, as um, Dr. Parikh mentioned. Some patients, for reasons that we don't always understand, will have uh, a postural component in IIH. Um, and I think predominantly this has to do with the fact that it's very difficult to separate out exertional headache from postural headache because it's uh, when you're upright and you're doing things, uh, you're both exerting and upright. And when you lay down, it's very hard to exert yourself uh, when you're laying down. Uh, so those, um, those components require uh, a lot of effort to try to uh, mm -hmm. disentangle. Uh, Craniocervical instability, um, as Simi mentioned, is a little bit of a murky diagnosis with murky diagnostic criteria. Uh, sometimes these patients will improve if you just put them in a soft cervical collar. That's sort of one thing that, that I look at. And we do see it in patients with connective tissue disorders. And then um, primary new daily persistent headache uh, can often have an, an abrupt onset. And there are some times when there's, there's an exertional component or, or uh, a positional component that's hard to explain. But when you think about the typical symptoms of intracranial hypotension, the two things that I would say that I really want you to remember are one, the orthostatic or the positional component of the headaches, and number two, the abrupt onset. Now, as you've heard, uh, th these rules are general guidelines that get violated. So there are people who have non-orthostatic headaches, headaches that start orthostatic and then become non-orthostatic, and um, rarely uh, patients who are acephalgic or they don't have um, headache at all. And in those patients, the symptoms are predominantly, uh, or, or most commonly, they are um, either auditory, meaning they have tinnitus, or um, cognitive, they have uh, a frontotemporal dementia-like symptoms. And uh, again, these typically have an abrupt onset. Some patients can recall the exact moment uh, and exactly what they were doing when they first noticed the onset of their headaches. In my experience, um, at least in my opinion, intracranial hypotension can be suspected on the basis of clinical symptoms, but because there's such a heterogeneous phenotype and because um, there's such a spectrum of the ways in which people uh, present, a confident diagnosis requires some imaging uh, abnormalities. Now you can have a patient who uh, has an ambiguous diagnosis and for those of you in the US, uh, there's some new uh, ICD-10 ICD codes, which I'm very grateful for. One of those is orthostatic headache, not otherwise special, uh, specified. Um, and some patients will present like that and there'll be a little bit of a diagnostic uh, conundrum, but for a confident diagnosis of intracranial hypotension, imaging uh, plays a, an important role. So we're gonna go over uh, brain imaging. I'm gonna show you some examples of uh, the three different types of causes uh, of spinal CSF leak. And we're gonna talk about selecting spine imaging uh, modalities that work to help identify some of these pathologies. This will have some level of detail, but predominantly this is sort of an overarching view of, of the whole process, just so you can sort of be familiar with it. So let's start with brain imaging. So when we think about brain imaging, I think there are three main signs on brain imaging that I would want you to remember. The first is the presence of diffuse, smooth, dural enhancement, uh, also known as pachymeningeal enhancement. The pachymeninges are that, uh, that layer outside of the, the leptomeninges, so we're not talking about leptomeningeal enhancement here, we're talking about pachymeningeal or dural enhancement. The second one is the venous distension sign or enlargement of the dural venous sinuses. 
And the third is a brain sagging or downward descent of the midbrain. And um, predominantly, uh, a lot of the signs that we see in intracranial hypotension are caused by that Monroe Kelly uh, doctrine, which uh, Dr. Perry mentioned. And that basically says that within the fixed confines of the cranium, there are three things. There's brain, and the brain tissue is relatively elastic. It can't change. So when you begin to lose CSF, the blood volume has to expand to take up the room. And that induces a uh, change in the, the normal vascular structure. One of the, the, those structures is the dura. And that um, uh, typically will have uh, uh, some enhancement normally because there's uh, vascularity in it. But in the setting of intracranial hypotension, that dura becomes a bit more noticeably enhancing. So this is a good example. This is a post-contrast image of the brain. Uh, both in axial and coronal. And you can see how thick and enhancing the dura is. And it's not just the supratentorial dura, it's the tentorium as well. And even down underneath the cerebellum, uh, you can see enhancement. Um, now, there really are no other disease conditions besides intracranial hypotension that cause diffuse smooth dural enhancement. There are other diseases that cause dural enhancement but that dural enhancement is typically either nodular or plaque-like or uh, localized. It is not both smooth and diffuse. So some examples of this would be uh, metastatic disease, uh, the disease that we used to call uh, Wegner's, it's uh, polyangiitis with granulomatosis or something like that. Uh, sarcoid, uh, you can get some reactive dural enhancement to a subdural a hematoma, uh, idiopathic hypertrophic pachymeningitis is uh, thought to be an IgG4 related disease. You can get uh, empyemas um, that uh, when you have infections that start outside of the skull and move inward. But none of these disease conditions that also cause dural enhancement cause diffuse and smooth dural enhancement. One of the uh, common clinical pitfalls that we'll see is that patients will have dural enhancement on their brain MR. And then they'll undergo multiple lumbar punctures because somebody thinks that they have uh, infectious meningitis. But infectious meningitis, as you uh, will recall, is a leptomeningitis, not a pachymeningitis. So um, people who present with classic meningeal signs, stiff neck, headache, things like that, those are not uh, those are signs of leptomeningitis, not pachymeningitis. Uh, the exception uh, to the infectious rule, as I mentioned, are infections that start outward and come in. So mastoiditis, infection in the sinuses that work their way in. But in those cases, the dural enhancement is localized to the area where the infection is, as in this case of empyema that I'm, I'm showing you, where just there's a small area of dural enhancement. So I want you to remember, diffuse smooth dural enhancement essentially is pathognomonic for um, SIH. The second sign we're going to talk about is the venous distension sign. And here, what I do is I go to uh, a sagittal image of the brain and I look for the, uh, the eye about at the level of the lens and look at the dominant uh, transverse venous sinus. What it should normally look like is a little arrowhead. So it should have flat or slightly concave margins, um, but in intracranial hypotension, it's rounded and distended. Um, and this is called the venous distension sign. So just to zoom that up a little bit, you can see that the, um, the venous, uh, uh, transverse venous sinus is markedly distended before treatment in this case, and it goes back to a normal appearance after treatment. The third sign is brain sagging. So uh, in patients who are leaking spinal CSF, their midbrain can start to shift downward. Um, and what we see is that the normal position of the floor of the third ventricle becomes altered. So normally, as you go from anterior to posterior, this line slopes up slightly. But in intracranial hypotension, it slopes down because the, the entire midbrain and indeed the entire brainstem is sagging downward. Uh, and so this can be seen in, in some, but not all cases of, of intracranial hypotension. This distance that I've marked in red on the normal scan is the distance between the mammillary bodies and the pons. It's called the mammillopontine distance. That also becomes narrowed in intracranial hypotension as the, as the floor of the third ventricle begins to descend downward. 
Um, so here's an example of a patient uh, with brain sagging, both pre and post treatment. You can see on the pre-treatment imaging, the floor of his third ventricle is all the way down behind the dorsum cella. So it's down almost uh, to the level of the, pitu the pituitary gland. But on uh, post-treatment imaging, uh, you can see that the, the floor of the third ventricle has ascended now and is, is no longer down where it was before, which was down here, it's moved upward. So this is a dynamic change that we will see with time. Uh, and just to reinforce that slope of the third floor, you can change as now, it's important to note, it, to note that at the brain stem, uh, uh, brain stem descends, you can have cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, um, and that can resolve treatment images. But brain sagging is not the same as a carry one malformation. And this is extremely important. I think everybody needs to be very cognizant of this point. Chiari one is a deformity of the posterior fossa. And while the position of the, the tonsils can change a little bit during childhood, you cannot acquire a Chiari malformation, which is a, a, a deformity of the posterior fossa in adulthood. Brain sagging is different from Chiari 1 malformation. And the problem is if you start using these terms interchangeably, people start getting suboccipital decompressions and uh, that doesn't help. And it, in fact, it can hurt. It's also worth noting that uh, patients with IIH, about 20% of them will have tonsillar ectopia. So it's really important to remember that not all cases of tonsillar ectopia is a Chiari 1 malformation. Just to show you graphically what I'm talking about here, in a Chiari 1 malformation, uh, you can see here that the uh, cerebellar tonsils are down, but the third ventricular floor hasn't descended uh, beyond the tentorial uh, margin. Whereas in intracranial hypotension, the floor is uh, descended, the mammalopontine distance is narrowed, oftentimes the pons will become flattened up against the back of the clivus, and the cerebellar tonsils are low, but this is not a Chiari malformation, this is brain sagging. So here's an example of what can go wrong. Uh, this patient was called a Chiari malformation, and indeed they do have low-lying cerebellar tonsils, and they have some pre-searing edema in their spinal cord but they miss the fact that the brain, uh, the third ventricular floor is sagging down. So this patient got a suboccipital decompression and unfortunately they herniated out through that suboccipital decompression because the problem in this case was a spontaneous spinal CSF leak and not the Chiari 1 malformation. Now, most of the cases are not this dramatic, but many people do get complications from uh, posterior decompression uh, for Chiari surgery. And so you wanna avoid cases like this. The other thing that we sometimes find is bilateral subdural hematomas in the absence of trauma. So if you have a younger patient in particular that has bilateral subdural collections with no history of trauma, you need to think about this condition. And this is another manifestation of the Monroe Kelly Doctrine where basically uh, decreased uh, intracranial pressure needs to be filled by something. And it starts pulling fluid out of the vascular space into the space around the brain. Um, and this patient uh, had a CSF leak that was repaired and the dural, uh, the subdural collections went away. It's also important to know that these subdurals will recur if the CSF leak is not treated first. So draining these collections uh, usually is an exercise in futility because they'll just either refill with fluid or they'll refill with air. Um, and you actually have to treat the CSF leak uh, first before you drain the subdural collections. Okay, next we're gonna talk about causes of spinal CSF leak. And there are three main causes. Um, all, the vast majority of CSF leaks occur in the thoracic spine. So most of these are gonna be occurring in the thoracic spine. The first one are uh, diverticula. And these are basically dural tears. So areas where the, the dura tears and the arachnoid membrane herniates out uh, through there. They usually occur at the armpit or the axilla of the exiting nerve root sleeve usually in the thoracic spine. And when the arachnoid layer herniates out, uh, that's a very fragile containment for the CSF. And that can be prone to rupture with things like valsalva or straining, or bending or twisting or other things like that. The other thing that you can get is dural tears due to bone spurs. And again, because calcified uh, discs most commonly happen in the thoracic spine, that's the place where we usually see this. And these usually result in large um, 
uh, high flow uh, uh, CSF leaks along the ventral aspect of the spine. The final uh, etiology that we talk about are CSF to venous fistulas. And CSF to venous fistulas are abnormal connections between the CSF in the nerve root sleeve and a normal adjacent uh, uh, paraspinal vein that then starts to siphon off the CSF. Um, and that is an etiology that's only really been known for about four or five years, but actually turns out to be a pretty uh, major cause of, uh, of CSF leaks, particularly in people who have normal spine imaging at first. As Dr. Parikh mentioned to you, skull-based CSF leaks typically do not cause a spinal CSF, uh, do not cause intracranial hypotension. So if you see brain imaging changes of intracranial hypotension, don't go looking at the skull base. You're most likely just wasting your time. Now, here are some examples from patients I've seen of, um, of these various leak types. So here's the diverticulum. Uh, you can see on uh, this myelogram uh, that you've got this focal outpouching, which is occurring right beneath the nerve root sleeve, the exiting nerve root sleeve in the lower thoracic spine. And on this, um, on this myelogram, as the patient is tilted on their side, you can actually see contrast streaming out into the epidural space from this irregular uh, lobulated uh, diverticulum. Here's another example. This was a 14-year-old girl who had a history of Marfan syndrome who has a massive CSF leak. You can see this big diverticulum, again, right underneath the axilla of the nerve root. It looks like this on the axial images. And you can see all of this around it is leaked CSF in the epidural space. This dark line here is the line of the dura. Everything external to that is leaked CSF. And here's a movie. Uh, you're going to see progressive images as this patient is tilted down and contrast is migrating up the spine. You'll see this big diverticulum and fluid is just pouring out both cranial and caudal uh, to that. So watch that again as I scroll through the images, you'll see fluid just pouring out of that uh, particular level. So that is a, a high flow CSF leak. This is the intraoperative video. You'll see a very thin walled uh, diverticulum here. Um, as the surgeon uh, begins to handle it, it ruptures very easily uh, right there. Um, and that's what these diverticula look like intraoperatively. Here's an example of a ventral uh, tear caused by this bone, uh, this uh, calcified disc protrusion in the thoracic spine. So you can see it's penetrating into the fecal sac. This is a lateral myelogram. So the contrast column is here in the, in the fecal sac. And you'll notice you'll start to see the contrast leaking out right here. So on subsequent images, you can see this parallel line. And that parallel line is contrast leaking out into the epidural space. Again, another example, here's a, uh, a calcified uh, disc protrusion on the myelogram. You can see contrast is streaming out through all the nerve roots. Uh, this is not multiple leaks. Most patients, uh, in fact, all patients typically have only one source of leak. But um, you can see there's this calcified disc protrusion, which is pushing into the fecal sac. And intraoperatively, this was the dural tear. And this shiny white thing is the disc that's actually penetrating into it. Finally, we have CSF to venous fistulas. Again, these are between uh, the fecal sac, the CSF, and veins. So the white stuff here is intrathecal contrast. So um, you should not have this going into veins under normal circumstances. But what you see is this vein in the paraspinal muscles filling with intrathecal contrast. On a coronal image from the myelogram, it looks like this. You can see this vein wrapping into the paraspinal soft tissues. Here's another image from a myelogram where you see this network of uh, veins in the same patient filling uh, inferior to this uh, nerve root sleeve. Uh, here's another example uh, just to show you there's a dilation uh, a diverticulum of the nerve root sleeve and you can see anterior to that there's all these veins that are filling uh, from that area and going back to the systemic uh, circulation while the other veins nearby uh, do not look uh, bright white like uh, the, the CSF venous fistula does. This uh, is what it looks like on the myelogram, a little more subtle to see that uh, vein coming off the tip of that uh, diverticulum. Okay, finally, we're gonna say just a few words about spine imaging. And I get asked often, what imaging should I start with when it comes to the spine? And the answer is you need a study that is good for identifying epidural fluid is available at your facility and that you are comfortable 
And this is going to vary from location to location. So the two basic choices when you're starting are CT myelography and MRI. The pros of MRI is that it's widely available. It's non-invasive. Most places have the uh, hardware to be able to do it. The cons are that it doesn't really show small leaks very well, and it does not show CSF to venous fistulas at all. So you may need some additional imaging afterwards. On the other hand, CT myelography is considered pretty much the gold standard for detection of leaks. Uh, it has very few artifacts, but technique is really important. And not every radiologist is going to feel comfortable doing a good high quality myelogram like is needed for CSF leaks. Just to show you some examples, um, Here's an example of uh, MR uh, imaging. Um, and you can see on this sagittal MR, there's fluid in the epidural space. Uh, this is an axial image. You can see this dark line of the dura and all of the bright uh, stuff uh, peripheral to that is leaked uh, CSF. Um, this is the same uh, patient a little bit lower down. And you can again see that dark line of the dura with leaked epidural CSF. Here's another patient who has a CSF leak. It's a little bit harder to see on this particular image uh, because the epidural fat is also kind of bright on T2-weighted images. So uh, difficult to see. This patient had something called um, an MR myelogram, which is, uh, doesn't require contrast. Some places do these. I don't particularly like them. Uh, in, in this case, at looking at this, I wouldn't know if this patient had a leak. But when you look at this in cross-sectional imaging, you can see there's a massive CSF leak. Uh, and it's a little less apparent based on that imaging. Now, on the other hand, CT myelogram is what we do in our institution. Um, here you can see an example of a, a dural diverticulum. You can see very nicely the very high spatial resolution that you get with CT myelography. Um, you can see how this is hanging just inferior to the nerve root in this particular case. CT myelography, if, if you do it very quickly after you inject the contrast, which usually means injecting the contrast directly on the CT uh, scanner table, can give you an idea about where the leak is coming from. So you'll notice in this particular case, there's a ventral CSF collection, and the concentration of the contrast is higher up, uh, is greater higher up in the spine than it is lower down. And that tells us that the leak is coming from higher up. So if we look at this on axial images, you'll notice that that ventral collection becomes progressively decreased uh, density as you go down. And that tells us that the leak is actually coming uh, from the upper end of this collection, which helps us localize it. Here's another example of a, a relatively subtle CSF leak in the ventral epidural space, and it's being caused by this calcified disc. So um, this case is an example of why I like CT myelography as opposed to MR uh, as a starting place. If I look at this MR scan, I have a very difficult time telling whether or not there's a CSF leak. There's flow artifact. There is uh, some fat here. There's some bright signal. Is that fluid? I don't know. It's very difficult to tell. Here's the CT myelogram, and there's a very subtle anterior uh, CSF leak, which is this crescentic uh, collection here. Um, the contrast resolution and spatial resolution are what help you in this particular case. Now, I'm briefly going to mention a couple of problem-solving studies, because as you get into uh, spinal CSF leaks, you'll understand uh, more that some of these leaks are very tricky. And there are two problems we deal with. One, the leak is too fast, and it's easy to find but hard to localize. And we have two techniques that we use uh, for this. Um, one is to do uh, imaging under fluoroscopy um, and to watch the contrast migrate up the spine as you tilt the patient downward. That can be done with or without uh, digital subtraction to make the um, the leak more obvious. There are pros and cons to using digital subtraction. I won't get into those. They're a little bit in the weeds for this talk. The other is a technique called ultrafast uh, CT. And I'll show you examples of this. So this is an example of a dy dynamic myelogram. The patient's put on a tilting fluoroscopy table. Now these images would be, um, they're oriented this way so they'll fit on my screen, but turn them 90 degrees in your head because this patient is lying in the decubitus position. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see contrast moving up the side of the spine, you can actually see it layering dependently with gravity here. So um, as the patient is uh, tilted and that contrast column migrates up the spine, you'll see this diverticulum starting to fill underneath the nerve root. And then you'll start to see contrast streaming um, out of that nerve root uh, into the epidural space. This confirms the presence of a leak and it also localizes that leak so we can provide targeted treatment 
and, uh, and or surgery if needed. This is an example of a, um, a video of a digital subtraction myelogram. And here you'll see a split in the contrast column right there uh, due to the leak of uh, fluid into the epidural space. This obviously makes a very nice image. Again, there are some cons for doing uh, digital subtraction. You have to use general anesthesia. You're limited in terms of the, the areas that you can evaluate. But in any case, um, it makes some nice images and shows clear leak. That same principle can be done under CT if you actually inject contrast um, into the patient's uh, fecal sac while the patient is head down and you image with CT imaging as that contrast is moving up their spine. So this is this patient. This is a, a sagittal image of their uh, upper thoracic spine. And you can see there's actually a split or a fork in the contrast uh, as the contrast is coming up the spine. It's moving downhill and there's a split right and part of it stays within the fecal sac. And that is an example of a leak. It was being caused by this calcified um, disc protrusion that was just like a little dagger tearing into the ventral aspect of the fecal sac. The second problem is that you do the spine imaging and no leak is seen. And what we've learned over the past five years is that the majority of these cases are due to uh, what we call a CSF to venous fistula. Um, and there are several techniques that we can use. Um, dynamic uh, myelography, again, where you're tilting the patient up. In this particular case, you can see a nerve root sleeve and all these little squiggly lines coming out from that is uh, contrast going into adjacent veins. Again, this can be made a little more conspicuous uh, with uh, digital subtraction uh, at the cost of using general anesthesia and sometimes um, a limited field of view. And then CT myelography, if you put the patient in the decubitus position uh, that can augment going to some of these fistulas. Um, uh, so these are three separate examples of CSF to venous fistulas. As I mentioned, it, really in the past year or two, we've started to recognize that. Um, um, so here's a patient uh, on this initial myelogram. All we saw was this tiny little wisp right here. And you're probably looking at that and saying, what? I don't see anything at all there. And you would be right. This is very, very minimal. But all we did um, is take this patient and turn them into the decubitus position and scan again. And now we can see a little bit more filling of that uh, vein uh, to the side there. And then we did one more myelogram. These three images are all from one myelogram. And then we did a second myelogram where we kept the patient in decubitus and in injected contrast to keep a higher concentration of of contrast, and now you can see this, this beautiful CSF to venous fistula just filling into this paraspinal vein. That confirmed where that, that fistula was coming from. We've learned that these fistulas oftentimes have to be treated surgically, so this was uh, ligated surgically, um, and the patient made a full recovery. Uh, we've also learned that respiratory effects can play a role. Um, so here's a patient, uh, it's a little bit harder to see, but this patient has this branching uh, structure here in the upper part of their thoracic spine. This is all filling of a, of a venous fistula and it's coming off of this nerve root right here. Uh, this was obtained during maximum inspiration. We asked the patient to Valsalva and what you can see is that uh, the fistula is a, initially apparent, but over the course of the next uh, couple of seconds uh, becomes inapparent. It actually goes away completely. Um, and so respiratory effects uh, do have uh, some uh, role to play. Uh, we had the patient take a deep breath in again, and again, we saw filling of that venous fistula. So there are some uh, techniques. These fistulas can be very difficult to find. Uh, our, our thought process on how to find them is constantly evolving. If I give this talk a year from now, uh, this information will likely be different. So we've talked about, we've reviewed um, uh, brain imaging findings in intracranial hypotension, and we've talked about dural enhancement, we've talked about brain sagging and the venous distension sign. We talked about the three different kinds of uh, CSF leaks that people get, which are leaks from uh, leaking uh, uh, calcified uh, bone spurs uh, and C CSF to venous, all of these come in the third line. And then we've talked about different imaging modalities that you can use for spine imaging, 
how to get started, either with CT monolography or MR, and then some problem solving techniques that, that uh, we can use for particular cases. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I appreciate uh, Dr. Parikh. Uh, I think we'll be taking some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Krenz, Dr. Simi Parikh, uh, for the great lectures. I'm sure all the attendees could learn so much about how to really address the investigation of these difficult cases. And to begin uh, our Q&A session, uh, the first question was addressed actually to the clinical presentation of these cases. Uh, uh, so to Simi, as far as acephalogic patients are, uh, is tinnitus or blurred vision or dizziness a more, com more common symptoms uh, in patients without headache? Right, so in patients without headache, I think tinnitus tends to be most common for the literature. But I would say that keep your eye open for any kind of refractory neurological symptoms that don't make a lot of sense. So the patient that I referenced, for example, her main complaint was actually neck pain. And so it wasn't actually even head pain, but neck pain. And then over time, you know, her pain changed and she ended up having um, kind of these ridiculous symptoms, tingling in her arms. Uh, so that tended to be kind of her main complaint. So. Uh, tinnitus is a big tip off, but I would again say that any sort of refractory neurological symptom should be in, this should be in the back of your mind. And in the end, tinnitus is also typical of the other differential that you mentioned, which is hypertensive headache, right? Right. So there's pulsatile tinnitus, which is, um, you know, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The tinnitus, that's a great point because the tinnitus, I think for spontaneous spinal CSF leak is not very well characterized like that. Um, and also it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be tinnitus. It could be muffled hearing. So hearing changes um, is actually, I would say maybe the right vocabulary to use there. Great, thank you. So the next question is from uh, Sa Perez, and she's asking: After a leak has been fixed via surgery, how long should it take uh, for sim symptoms of the leak to go away? Particularly hearing-related symptoms are, and are some symptoms considered to be permanent? Um, I'm not sure. Simi or yeah. Peter, who, who do you who prefers uh, to? I, I can give I can give you my. Um... My perspective on it. So one of the things that we didn't talk about that's very important is a condition called rebound high pressure or rebound intracranial hypertension, where uh, people sort of overshoot uh, their CSF pressure. And that can cause um, some headache symptoms, unfortunately. Um, the morphology often changes from an orthostatic to a non-orthostatic headache, and that's one of the main things that we look for. So um, in terms of headache, you wanna be attentive to whether or not the headache phenotype changes after, uh, after surgery. Um, hearing related symptoms do take a little bit of time sometimes to go away. Um, the inner ear, you know, the perilymph in the inner ear is connected to the CSF. Um, and so I think that's probably why people have so many auditory disorders associated with this condition. And there seems to be some sort of uh, injury, some uh, short-term injury, uh, maybe to the hair cells or, or something like that, that takes a little while to resolve. So it's, it's common that people will resolve their headache before they resolve the tinnitus and some of the auditory symptoms. But typically I'll, I'll give it a couple months um, before I start doing anything if they're otherwise doing well from a headache standpoint. That's just my experience. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pravin Thomas is asking uh, about the treatment uh, to Dr. Sim directly. Should targeted blood patch be the first approach rather than non-targeted? I think in an ideal setting, and um, Peter, tell me if you disagree, I think you know most people should get a targeted blood patch. I feel like... Um, they tend to have more efficacy. So, you know, you wouldn't have to repeat the blood patch. Um, but I think realistically, the resources are not available to always get a targeted blood patch 
So my rule of thumb for my patients is to get what you can um, on the sooner side. So if there's a wait for many months to get a CT mammogram, I would tell them to get you know, an untargeted blood patch. And we can do up to three untargeted blood patches um, to see if the symptoms resolve. But if they get an untargeted blood patch and we're able to get them, you know, then if the symptoms are continued and we are able to get them into uh, a CT myelogram or a targeted blood patch situation, I would prefer that. The bottom line is, you know, targeted blood patches are always preferred. If you have easy access, you know, I, I don't see a reason why that shouldn't be the first step. But if, if the resources are limited, then do at least three trials of untargeted blood patches. Peter, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I agree completely. Um, I, I think the the spectrum of patients who Simi and I see is probably different from the you know the ninety percent of people who present in the community, and uh, not every place you go will have a specialty center that treats intracranial uh, hypotension. So, um, I think you know. Uh, think that non-targeted blood patch. Um, if you know the diagnosis is confirmed, but you don't know where the leak is coming from, then I think it's reasonable to do a non-targeted blood patch. Uh, I think, you know, the more you can target it, uh, the better the outcome will be. But there are plenty of people who will get better on their own without targeted blood patches. So I think you have to use the resources that you have available to you and don't feel like uh, there's no role uh, for treating locally uh, it, it, using the resources that you have. Great, thank you. Uh, so next question, it's a difficult question, uh, but a good question from Pamela Blake. Uh, how often do you see a definite diagnosis of a spinal CSF leak in a patient with one, no history of a uh, dual puncture and two, no positional effect, uh, chains of pain and three, a normal MRI scan of the brain? Uh, maybe Peter, you could uh, attempt. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so yeah. by definitive diagnosis, I presume that you mean that a spinal uh, leak was ultimately identified. I, I think, as I mentioned, symptoms, it's not to say that those, those diagnoses don't exist, but it's hard to be definitive. Um, but the answer, uh, I, I think, to that would be, I haven't seen it. So what we know is that the brain imaging is about 85 to 90% uh, sensitive, um, and uh, spinal imaging really before we knew about fistulas was about uh, six, 50 to 60% sensitive. It's probably gone up uh, since, uh, since then, since we know about what we're looking for. Um, and I think if, um, uh, so I think uh, the, a non-positional headache is uh, a less common presentation. So you're, you're talking about patients with negative brain imaging, uh, which is uncommon in SIH, with an uncommon uh, clinical presentation. It's not to say it's impossible, but um, I think you would really have to, uh, I, I, I don't That's my different, people will have, have different opinions about that because I think the yield for that is lower. I think if you have orthostatic headache, yes, that's uh, a workup. Uh, if you have brain imaging changes, that's definitely you have a diagnosis. Um, but uh, otherwise, we'll be working up many, many, many patients who, with negative uh, uh, negative results. All right, thank you. So Dr. Simi, uh, Dr. Pravin Thomas is asking about the second case you presented. Uh, he's asking, what is the mechanism of improvement for, with NSAIDs, non-steroids, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs in headache uh, if low pressure is the issue in that case, in the second one? Okay. Um, so I think the second one, uh, it was the, the seven-year-old woman, I believe. Um, I know I mentioned the NSAIDs, I, I think, with the first one who also had migraine. So this is what I would say as a headache medicine specialist. I think there can be many, and I, and I kind of alluded to as well with the third case who ended up responding to anti-migraine medications, um, who I believe has a leak. Uh, 
So uh, I think there can be many insults to the brain. So someone can have concussion, someone can have meningitis, someone can have actual migraine, and that all activates the trigeminal vascular system. And so I think that even with spinal CSF leak, there can be some responsiveness to, my, to medications that you might uh, typically use to treat the pneumogenic inflammation that happens with that system activation. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't also have a leak. I think that leak has also caused them to be vulnerable to trigeminal vascular system activation and neurogenic inflammation. And so the NSAIDs can treat that part of it. But I, I would not expect those patients to be fully better. So like I had mentioned in the third case, that patient got somewhat better uh, when, their system, when their symptoms got exacerbated. Um, and they responded to anti-migraine medications, but their positional component never did resolve. And so again, I think these types of insults to the brain can morph into um, various types of pathology. Thank you. Great. Oh, well, uh, there are so many uh, good questions. I'm not sure we, that we can answer all of them. Uh, I was seeing one question from, uh, Dr. Manjit Methau, which uh, I think is, is an excellent question and something that many uh, clinicians think about. In patients for whom the site of the leak is unknown, how many non-targeted blood patches would you recommend clinicians to do, to do before chasing the site uh, of the, the leak? I think it depends on how patients respond to those blood patches. There, there will be some people who get excellent relief for months at a time uh, before they have a recurrence of their symptoms. With those kind of people, you can generally um, be a little more patient with non-targeted blood patches, particularly if, you know, between each patch, the, when it, you know, when their symptoms recur, it doesn't fall to the severity that, that it was in the beginning. So after each patch, if their plateau is a little bit better each time, then I think you can continue with, with some non-targeted blood patches. What we know uh, about CSF venous fistulas is that they tend not to respond as well to blood patching um, as traditional epidural leaks. Um, and so there are gonna be some people who, who have very little improvement after blood patches. Um, and I think those are people who, you know, maybe do one or two and then, and then move them on. Thank you. Uh, well, I believe we really won't have time for all the questions. There are many interesting ones. Uh, we will try to, to go further here uh, for a couple, maybe 15 more minutes. So it, is, it uh, is it possible to have a CSF leak from a Tarlov cyst? Uh, um, you know, I think there, there's some confusion. Uh, because Tarlov cysts uh, are very common. They occur in the sacrum. And they're different uh, uh, pathologically than, than the diverticula I showed in my talk, which are actually dural tears in which the arachnoid layer is herniated out through. Um, and, but both of them on imaging kind of look similar. They look like diverticula. Um, and so because the word diverticulum gets used interchangeably, uh, there's some confusion about that. And it's even hard to go back in the literature and, and disentangle those two things. I, I will say that I have seen uh, only a very small number of sacral leaks, maybe three or four out of, let's say, 500 leaks that, I, that I've seen. And, um, and none of them were coming from Tarlov cysts. So I'm sure somebody's got case somewhere. I'm sure it happens. But uh, as I mentioned, the majority of the, the leaks come from the thoracic spine or close by. So the lower cervical or upper lumbar spine. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's very uncommon. Uh, if I see a Tarlov cyst on a, on a, on a patient's skin with um, intracranial hypotension, I don't spend um, much time looking at it. All right. Um... So we'll go on. There is a question um, again by Thomas Perrin and Dr. Peter Kranz. In those patients you noted to have a leak with a CSF pressure of more than uh, 300 or I guess it's 30 uh, centimeters of water, what was the headache phenotype 
that of high or low pressure and what was the leak and, and was the leak detected incidentally or was there a clinical suspicion as well? It's a, that's a great question. Now, there's one patient who I can think of I've seen recently. She, she's a very large lady um, and many of the, the patients who have elevated CSF pressures uh, do tend to be larger. Um, she, um, her BMI was, was very high. She had a clear leak. Uh, she had clear orthostatic headache um, and that it began abruptly, but she had a background of non-orthostatic headache in the past. Um, did she have um, IIH that was undiagnosed and just not as clinically symptomatic and that elevated intracranial pressure had maybe did or didn't have a role in causing her CSF leak? It's hard to know in retrospect, people certainly have proposed that that may be the case. But I would say that um, people who have been leaking for longer periods of time tend to have higher pressures, we know that. And people who have larger body habitus tend to have higher pressures. Uh, we know that. So uh, the patients who have those higher uh, pressures um, oftentimes are, are big patients who have been leaking for a while. Simi, do you have you seen that? Uh, um, so I mean, we definitely have seen you know various um, presentations of IH, SIH, and it is you know very interesting. Um, but I, I think it's, we're still kind of thinking about this in our uh, community, you know, I think there's a change that happens in cerebral venous flow and the compliance in the cerebral veins that then affects the pressure, the, the body's ability to regulate pressure. And so I think that's why there really is an overlap between SIH and IH and there's a spectrum of, of pressure disorders rather than just individual entities. It's, it's interesting. interesting. The uh, skull-based CSF, CSF leaks are definitely associated with IIH, but as Simi mentioned, the CSF pressure when you're upright is very different above uh, C5 uh, in your cervical spine. Uh, it's actually negative with respect to the atmosphere when you're upright, and below that it's positive. So that the physics of what's happening with CSF pressure when you're upright are very different in your thoracic and lumbar spine as compared to your head and your uh, upper cervical spine. Very, very interesting, thank you. Uh, Dr. Carolina Eiting asks about the intermittent leak on image to Dr. Uh, Peter Krenz, how these intermittent leaks can be ex explained and the, are these more related to people with EDS uh, I can't say that I have seen any cases of, of truly intermittent leaks. Um, there have been some cases uh, I've seen where fistulas are sometimes seen and sometimes not seen. I've seen cases where people have had leaks treated um, and then they go away and then they recur probably because the patient stressed it mechanically uh, or um, you know, through a valsalva or something like that and began leaking again but just sort of on their own, untreated. Sometimes it's leaking, sometimes it's not. I can't say for sure that I've ever seen that. Again, I, I, don't, like to, um, I don't like to say never because there's a lot of things I've been surprised by. I, I, I think there are plenty of areas in this realm where we don't, there, there's stuff that we don't know. So I try to you know, be, be very upfront about uh, what we know for sure and what we don't know for sure. So I, I don't know for sure that there is nobody who, who leaks intermittently. All I can say is that in the you know five or six hundred patients who I, I've I've seen with definite leaks, I've never seen that phenomenon. Thank you. There are, there are some questions regarding medication. I mean, how to to treat uh, with medication using caffeine. There's also the mention of a two field line uh, by Yadia Flores. So, uh, Simi, could you elaborate right, a, a bit about uh, medical treatment of uh, Intracranial yeah. hypertension. So, if I, so I in our center, we see patients more often with refractory pain. So these aren't people who just started having symptoms of leak. If someone comes in and they just have started having symptoms of leak, I think medications can be a way to you know go because they can resolve spontaneously. And in that case, I do often recommend caffeine um, in oral tablets or caffeinated beverage. Uh, to take, you know, as they need to for symptom management. 
And then um, you mentioned theophylline. Uh, so there, there was a, a study in neurology about IV aminophylline uh, that was given um, to people who had post puncture leak headaches. And so that can be extrapolated to using oral theophylline um, as a symptom kind of management. It works in a similar way as caffeine. We do occasionally give that to our patients. And I would say that the benefit is about 50-50. So some patients do respond to that and some patients don't. More often it's patients who respond to caffeine will also respond to theophylline. Um, and uh, in terms of how caffeine works, I think you know it, it, it does supposedly increase uh, the amount of CSF uh, that's produced. And you know that's one theory as to why that helps. Um, but in my patients who have refractory pain, I tell them that they can use these medications for symptom relief, but I do ultimately want them to get a blood patch because at that point, I don't think they'll be resolving spontaneously. And these medications in those cases, again, are more like band-aids to symptoms rather than actually addressing the issue, which is an ongoing leak. And how long would you observe them before uh, sending to the blood patch with uh, caffeine and conservative measures? So I would say, um, you know, I don't know if there's any data on exactly when we're expected for the spontaneous resolution to happen, but I would say I would give them about 14 days um, and then, you know, follow them closely and see if they uh, have gotten better. If their symptoms are still present after 14 days, then I really want to know how disabled they are. You know, how is this affecting their life? Um, if they're like slowly improving, then we might end up waiting a little bit longer. But if they haven't gotten better at all and they're very disabled, they're lying in bed for most of the day, then I might be more aggressive in terms of sending them for a patch. Okay. I think I have a question for both uh, from Marcelo Calderaro. Uh, does your treatment protocol change according to the etiology? Uh, for instance, if you find a spur, you refer immediately to surgery or you try one or two epidural blood patches before? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Yes, I think, I think it does. Uh, if you have a, a leaking diverticulum, those are going to be the most amenable to epidural blood patches. So I'll, I'll try with those. Um, the spurs are, uh, you know, if, if you have a spur that is, is interposed into the dura, so it's actually sticking through the dura, you can patch that uh, uh, very technically effectively, but that, that may never uh, heal completely because the, the bone is still sticking into the, into the fecal sac. Um, so we do sometimes get patients who uh, have their symptoms go away, sometimes uh, with resolution of the leak, and sometimes they'll have a slowdown in the leak and their symptoms still persist, but they, they no longer are symptomatic. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to patch those people maybe once, maybe twice, but I do have a lower threshold for sending them to surgery. And for the patients with the fistulas, what we found, we, we did a prospective study on those patients to see what their outcomes were. And it turned out that about 15% of patients uh, with, with fistulas were getting better with targeted patching, uh, whereas about 85 uh, to 90% of them were getting better with surgery. So uh, most of the time now I'm sending those patients to surgery right away. If, if they really don't want to go to surgery and they say, you know, listen, I'm not that symptomatic or I, I'm really uh, anxious about going to surgery, uh, then we'll try some targeted um, patching for those patients. But um, more and more, I'm sending those patients directly to surgery because patching doesn't seem to be as effective for them. And in this case, do you uh, have uh, in your service experience with minimally invasive or endoscopic surgery? So um, I think one could do it uh, minimally invasive. I don't uh, possibly endoscopic. Uh, the, the surgery required in the world of spine surgery is not typically a big surgery for the fistulas. Um, they do a very small incision. Sometimes they'll take off a little bit of the lamina um, and, and usually uh, ligate or clip the entire nerve root. So it's fortunate that these come off of thoracic nerve roots, which are not typically functionally all that important uh, because they'll, they'll clip that entire nerve root. Uh, because if you, if you don't do that, sometimes you miss little bits of the fistula and it'll come back. 
Um, but um, but the recovery, usually they're in the hospital for a day or two and then they go home. So it's, it's not a huge uh, surgery. It's much harder. It's a much harder surgery when the patients have the ventral bone spurs and they have to get around to those. Oftentimes that's a, a much bigger deal uh, for the surgeon to get to. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So the, there's a, a, a practical question, but a very relevant uh, question from uh, Rachel Pienka. Uh, how long after a blood patch will the patient be able to return to normal exercise? Simi? I, I use the criteria actually that was developed, I think, by Duke. Um, and, you know, I'd love Peter's thoughts on this too. But usually, you know, we say at least six months you know, of, of kind of graduated activity. Um, so, you know, within three months, you know, really nothing, not lifting much um, more than five pounds in the first three months, no more than 10 pounds in the first, um, uh, sorry, no more than five pounds in the first month, no more than um, 10 pounds in the first three months, and no more than 20 pounds in the first six months, and then kind of see how they do. I really, you know, just from anecdotal evidence, um, I always advise my patients not to ever move with heavy furniture. I find that even if they got a, a patch and they were doing great years ago, if they go and start moving heavy furniture, they will end up with a repeat leak. So I do tell them, you know, uh, really avoid bending and lifting and as much as possible the twisting um, for as, you know, kind of like as much as possible, um, even after those six months are ended. And then some exercises are great. And that's actually a really important point because the other issue that can happen with these patients is that they've become completely deconditioned. They're lying in bed for most of the day um, originally. And so I think swimming pool exercises are good. So still water, there is some component of hydrostatic pressure that increases the venous, you know, uh, the venous pulling in the legs that can help with my patient. So I do often tell them about still water. You don't want to be in an ocean where there's twisting or anything that can happen to the spine, but pull exercises can be really good. And so I recommend them, that for them um, as an ongoing exercise, even as they're recovering. Um, but Peter, I would love your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, no, we do the same and it's non-scientific, but I basically tell them no exercise for the first month. Um, and then back to uh, walking, recumbent bike, uh, pool exercises, uh, you know, for months two and three. And then beyond that, they just need to avoid things like yoga or Pilates, uh, things that are really mechanically very stressful on their back. But I, I, I echo the point that Simi made, which is, you know, just in the past month, I had a patient who got a surgical repair of a leaking diverticulum. Um, and after that, uh, um, her uh, headache, her orthostatic headache recurred. Mm, I think uh, there's a lagging up signal. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, we yeah, can hear you now. You're back. So if you can just repeat. Uh... Okay. Uh, yeah. Longer leaking, but her orthostatic headaches had come back. And when they came back, they came back with some lightheadedness. Um, and fatigue and exercise intolerance. And she had developed POTS from deconditioning um, after, uh, her, uh, after her surgery. Um, and so at that point, it was a matter of treating the POTS and reconditioning, but the, but the orthostatic headache felt the same to her. So she couldn't tell the difference. She thought she was leaking again. Thank okay, you. thank you. So for our last question, uh, I'd like to ask for both how it works in investigation in your hospitals, in your settings, do you always have the inpatient investigation, uh, all, all the, the exams you need to do, or it's an outpatient follow-up and then with each of the uh, exams you uh, presented, Peter? Uh, we do almost all the cases outpatient. Um, we'll typically have them come in for two days. Uh, the first day they get their spine imaging, um, they typically have had a, a brain imaging ahead of time. They'll come in for their spine imaging. And then the day I meet with one of us and we'll do the blood patch if that's what we're going to do. Um, usually it's enough to need to be in the hospital. 
as we do um, outpatient. How, how about you, Simi? How, how it works in Jefferson Headache Center? So our, uh, similarly to what Peter was saying, we um, see our patients outpatient. So they will oftentimes get a diagnostic CT myelogram first to review images and then be scheduled for the therapeutic um, patch or whatever you know ends up being what is needed. So it is outpatient. Um, you know, occasionally there might be a patient that's admitted under observation if they're very severely debilitated and cannot travel um, at all. So, but otherwise, um, again, everything is outpatient. Okay, thank you. It's, um, it's unfortunate that there are so many good comments I see in the comment section and the questions and answers we could probably do this all night. Yeah, yeah, I believe we, we it was a very, very interesting webinar. Uh, fantastic lectures and all the interaction. I thank all the audience uh, for participating and bringing so much uh, interesting uh, questions. And I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Krenz and Dr. Simi Perek for sharing us with us your experience in this challenging condition. And thank you very much, Henrik, too, for uh, participating with us here. And uh, a good evening, a good morning, and a good night for all of you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Just one last reminder. The webinar is going to be available in a few weeks. Uh, for uh, a short period for uh, all attendees uh, and to be shared and then back only for members of the IHS. So I invite you all to renew your membership and we are having many other activities which are definitely worth uh, following.